Namaste. Welcome to another episode of Yoga Vasishta. Yoga Vasishta is becoming my favorite book ever. <laughs> I've studied so many great scriptures of the Vedas and the Brahma Sutras and even the Buddha Sutras, but nothing really compares with it. It's like a great compendium uh, of Advaita. Dvaita means duality. Advaita means non-duality. And that doesn't mean necessarily oneness, but it means no two-ness. <laughs> so this is a very difficult philosophy, especially for people trained up in Western thought. And it's very easy to get it wrong. A lot of people do. So Yoga Vasishta has the advantage of presenting literally thousands of examples and metaphors and similes and different, uh, not only instructions on meditation and recommendations of how to live a good and holy life, but also stories of sages in the past who attained the highest enlightenment. So right now we're going through the first book, which is basically Rama's uh, speech upon becoming disgusted with the world and asking the basic question, the essential question of all human life, how to eliminate suffering. Whatever we see in the world, living or inert, are all as impermanent as things seen in a dream. The hollow desert that appears as the dried bed of a sea today will be found tomorrow to be a running flood. What today is a mountain reaching the sky is in course of time leveled to the ground and afterwards is dug into a pit. The body that today is clothed with garments of silk, tomorrow is to be cast away naked into a ditch. What is seen to be a city today passes in the course of a few days into an uninhabited wilderness. The man who is very powerful today in a few days is reduced to a heap of ashes. The very forest that is so formidable today with the passage of time turns into a city with its banners hoisted in the air. In time, a formidable jungle of thick forests becomes a tableland like Mount Meru. Water becomes land and land becomes water. Thus the world with all its contents becomes something else in course of time. And this applies to everything. Everything in the world changes and eventually becomes its own opposite. Huh? We've seen this, especially in the area of religion, that a religious organization, which is founded to provide truth and relief from suffering to people, winds up propagating some propaganda, some nonsense, huh? and becomes a source of suffering for people. It oppresses people. It categorizes people in, uh, in a very undignified way as being enemies, those who are not true believers, huh? heretics, and so on. So religion can become its own opposite. Similarly, uh, so-called democracy can also become its own opposite and turn into fascism, whereas communism can turn around and become capitalism. Everything in life is subject to change. Life itself turns into death. So everything becomes its own opposite and the world just keeps going around and around like that. This is the wheel of samsara. Samsara means repeated birth and death in the material world. And it's full of suffering. Why is it full of suffering? Well, to begin with, people take this changeable world 
this dreamlike existence as being real and solid and reliable. It's not. It's not any of those things. It's not predictable either. <laughs> but if you take it that way and you bet on it, you make decisions based on this idea of the world being real and solid and so on, of course you're going to be disappointed. And then you're going to suffer. So Yoga Vasishta is going to give us the solution to this problem. And we'll learn more of it as we go along here. The days of great men, their glories and deeds, are retained only in our memories, and in a short time such must be with us also. Many things are decaying and renewing day by day. In this ever-changing world, there is no end to this accursed course of events. Men degenerate into lower animals, and those again rise to humanity. Gods become non-gods. There is nothing that remains the same. Riches and relatives, friends, servants, and wealth are of no pleasure to him who is in constant dread of death. All these are delightful to a sensible man, only so long as the monster of death does not appear before the eye of his mind. We have prosperity at one moment, succeeded by adversity at another. We have health at one time, followed by sickness soon after. What intelligent being is there who is not misled by these delusions of the world, which show things other than what they are, and serve to bewilder the mind? So, the world of phenomena, the relative world of material existence, is not something we can rely on. It's not something we can count on. It's not something that we can value and give any weight to, because it's like a cartoon. It's absurd in so many ways. It's so self-contradictory. Uh, light turns into black. <laughs> Good turns into bad. Uh, poverty turns into wealth and the reverse, and so on and so on. How can we count on any of this? We can't. So the solution, the remedy, is not to put any reliance on this changeable, false world. But, on the other hand, God, or Brahman, never changes, is always the same, is absolutely reliable, and is the source of everything and every quality that we love about this world. So everything good is there in unlimited quantity in Brahman. Yet, instead we put our reliance in the false, phony world. Huh? And we think this is going to give us happiness. And then when it doesn't, we're so disappointed. So the cure advocated by Vasishta is to don't put any reliance on this world, but put all your trust in God. Don't look to this world, this temporary, always changing world for happiness. Huh? Derive your happiness only from God. Then you'll never be disappointed. Huh? Because you're not expecting anything from the world. You have no desire for the world. And you have no egotism either of thinking, I am this, I am that. Because it's going to change, often unpredictably. Instead, we place all our trust in God, in Brahman. And that's a sure thing. That will bring us the happiness that we seek. The mind that gets delighted one moment becomes dejected in the next, then assumes its equanimity at another, is indeed as changeful as an actor. The creator, 
who in his work of creation is ever turning one thing into another, is like a child who makes and breaks his doll without concern. The actions of producing and harvesting, of feeding and destroying, come by turns to mankind, like the rotation of day and night. Neither adversity nor prosperity is of long duration with worldly people. They are ever subject to appearance and disappearance by turns. Time is a skillful player and plays many parts with ease, but he is chiefly skilled in tragedy and he often plays his tragic part in the affairs of men. All beings, according to their past good and bad deeds, are produced like fruit in the great forest of the universe. Time, like a gust of wind, blasts them day by day before their maturity. So this is the world. Can anybody get happiness? Can anybody get peace by relying on this changeable world? It's not possible. It's like trying to stop the wind or trying to stop the sun from setting. Huh? No, I want it to stay light forever. <laughs> Not going to happen. Because everything is followed by its opposite, and indeed often turns into its opposite, as we noted. So what hope is there to gain any satisfaction or peace in this world? It's just not possible. Even one's own mind is completely unreliable. Huh? One minute it's here, the next minute it's on the other side of the universe. <laughs> so the mind is no refuge either. Try to understand. Huh? The reason we suffer is that we put our reliance in things that are unreliable. And we ignore the things that are reliable, like God and Brahman. We think this world is real and solid, but it's not. It's a dream. Huh? This answers the question, by the way, of why is there evil in the world? Why does God act the part of tragedy by taking away our lives and everything else? with his influence of time. And the reason is, or the answer to this question is, none of this is real. It's all just a dream. Nobody laments if they wake up in the morning and their dream is finished. Why? Because it was just a dream, right? And what is it about dreams? When you're in them, they seem absolutely real. But then when they pass away, you see that they're temporary. So they're of no value. But wait a minute, the same is true of the world of, of, that we see in waking consciousness. It comes into existence, exists for some time, and then passes away. It may persist a little longer than our sleeping dreams, it may be a little more self-consistent than our sleeping dreams. And so relative to those dreams, it seems more real. But relative to actual reality, which is eternal, changeless, and always constant and the same, the world of phenomena is just another dream. And that's why God has no problem destroying everything that he's created. Actually, he hasn't created it <laughs> because it's just a dream. We don't think when we have a dream at night that, oh, I created this and it's very valuable and I have to save it. <laughs> no, because we know it's just a dream. It's just a temporary creation of our minds. But similarly, so is the waking world, a creation of our minds, and it's so temporary, just like our sleeping dreams. Huh? Maybe it lasts a little longer, but that's all. 
It's here today and gone tomorrow. So why should we put any reliance on this? Why should we trust this world? Huh? That's why it's a tragedy. Only because of that. If we took it simply as an entertainment and didn't put any value in it, then it wouldn't bother us when it goes away. And if we have the certainty of the refuge of Brahman, if we are comfortable with the emptiness of pure consciousness, filled with existence, knowledge, and bliss huh? for eternity, without any limit, without any end, if we're okay with that, then we have no need to put any value on this changing world. And so that is the solution to all suffering. Om Tat Sat. Om Harihi Om. Karunar Navamai Kardakadinalgum Aruna Chalashivam Yidam